we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of the now. Yes. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Buffalo Springfield saying that in the 1960s. But with what's happening in the Ukraine, what's happening with climate, what's happening in financial instability, what's happening in social unsustainability and inequality, are raising questions among everyone about whether we have a system, whether we have what you might call the means to avoid a war, whether our children are going to be able to survive or thrive. These two gentlemen, Kevin Gallagher, he's from the uh, Boston University, runs a, a Global Development Policy Center, and Richard Gauzel Wright, who has been a guest on this podcast before, he's the director of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development's Globalization and Development Strategies. They've written a book that is, how I say, the time is ripe for us to read and explore the vision that I've had the privilege of exploring here in the last couple of days since I've seen the book. The Case for a New Bretton Woods. Uh, Polity Press puts it out, and uh, it's clearly, as we approach the World Bank's uh, and IMF meetings and so forth, it's a challenge that I really admire that you gentlemen have put together to go to the table and using the analogy of Bretton Woods, uh, meaning another time coming out of dysfunction when something coherent was created. So thank you both for joining me today. And uh, let me start with you, Kevin. What inspired you guys? I mean, I'm talking about all the craziness going on, but what inspired you guys to do this and to think you can make a difference? Well, it's great to be on this show with you, Rob. Uh, we in 2018 and 2019 were very concerned about the about the modest at best response of the global system in responding to the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And heading into 2018 and 2019, there was a massive rise of right-wing populism, a rising inequality around the world, and a lack of real action on climate change. And so uh, with UNCTAD, the Global Development Policy Center put together a bunch of uh, focus groups with civil society heads, union representatives, policymakers, and so forth. And we said, we need to repivot these institutions for the 21st century, like we did in 1944 during Bretton Woods. And we need to put together a set of guiding principles that would do that. And Richard and I uh, released a short pamphlet in 2019. And then uh, in the midst of the COVID crisis, where we saw once again not learning the lessons of 2008 and 2009, we saw how the multilateral system failed to vaccinate the world, failed to deal with uh, the liquidity issues, and failed to deal with the financial instability that came around uh, from the COVID crisis, that we just buried ourselves uh, in our offices for a few weeks and, did, and banged out this larger book to spell out a larger case for a Bretton Woods moment. We don't want to go back to Bretton Woods. Uh, these aren't. We're not going to be issuing new MAGA hats around here. But what was, what was amazing, especially for this time, and we didn't anticipate the war, uh, is that the conversation about the need for a set of principles that would guide global economic governance for a century started in, say, 1933 and culminated in 1944 in the midst of massive populism, in the midst of massive inequality, and in the midst of an actual war is when they actually forge these things. Uh, that era did not let a good crises go to waste. They put together a set of principles and a set of institutions that worked relatively well uh, until, say, the early 1980s. And this book calls for that kind of a moment. We're calling for a global discussion to realign uh, global economic institutions for our collective climate, social, and development goals. Richard, uh, I, I must say right at the outset, 
I am so glad that my Young Scholars Initiative has a summer school that's an affiliate with UNCTAD. And this is, this is grist for the mill this coming time. I mean, this is really exciting to me to see you stepping up like this together. But Richard, I, yeah, you live, you live in I think we will pick up these issues, Rob, in the summer school uh, in August this year very much. We want to focus on these issues. I, I mean, I would just add to what Kevin has said. Um, you know, UNCTAD in a way has been on the front line of these issues for, you know, since the beginning, <laughs> when back in the 1960s, when we were disgruntled or, or dissatisfied to some extent with the way in which the development issue had been handled by the Bretton Woods institutions. I mean, you know, coming out of the increased political independence of developing countries, they didn't think the rules of the game that had been hatched in the in the uh, 1940s really touched on many of their cons concerns, particularly when it came to access to long-term, stable, affordable finance. So, so you know, UNCTAD has been at this trying to reform those rules for some time, but it was very much in the in the 60s and 70s a reformist agenda. I I think you know there was a massive shift, of, as you know, in the in the rules of the game from the late 1970s early 1980s and call it what you like neoliberalism hyper globalization you know there's a big debates i know about how you actually describe that that shift but it was a fundamental shift uh, away in many respects from from what had actually been established in 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 Bretton Woods the the need for a multilateral system not to override governments not to reduce their policy space but in, in to support governments in their endeavors for a more inclusive and sustainable growth and development path. I mean, it was it was heavily dictated by the needs and interests of advanced economies, but it, that was the intent of multilateralism. You know, this, despite the kind of conventional histories that you hear about a kind of 75 year old, you know, rules based international order, that's not really the story of the post-war era. There was a, a real radical rethinking and shift in the late 70s, early 80s, in a way that we found to be much more inhospitable to the to the needs and interests of developing countries um, than, than was true of the original model. And so, you know, we've been, we moved interestingly in UNCTAD from being essentially reformers of the system, right? That we, we thought this was the system that was a good system in principle, the, and as we try and articulate in the book too, um, uh, uh, but it needed needed change, but it didn't need radical overhaul to to a system that was uh, because you know because the need for developing countries to have their own development path in a way was accommodated within the old Bretton Woods system. By the by the time we got into the late seventies, early eighties, the system had shifted from that idea of, of of a multilateralism that was there to support a kind of progressive state. Uh, agenda to essentially being enablers of this new highly financialized world and that was a world that we saw as being particularly hostile to what developing countries need to to um to to progress and so we've been kind of very critical of this Bretton Woods 2.0 or whatever you like to call it for the last 30 or 40 years and, and there's some big issues that we'll talk about in there I think that that we try and uh, uh, articulate in the book, of which p perhaps the biggest, and it's become even more significant, I think, in, in over the last decade, uh, is of course the question of uh, public debt, uh, sovereign debt, the, the whole pressures that developing countries now face because of the burden of debt that's on them, which we don't think essentially means that they can't deliver the kind of sustainable development goals that the international community has, has um, uh, committed itself to. And without fundamental change, I, I mean, we're not we're not arguing for a completely new system, but without some fundamental changes in that system, it will be very difficult to meet the climate crisis, to meet the growing problems around inequality that Kevin uh, talked about, and now to meet the problem of the geopolitical problems that have emerged as a consequence uh, of the war itself. In my uh, experience in running a podcast, I get frequent comments about climate change. Why do we all talk about it and do nothing? And my sense is the specter and the danger related to climate deterioration and the fierce 
accidents and things that happen vis-a-vis the weather and flooding and coastal cities is uh, is really haunting people. And, and the IPCC just put out a report that essentially said, we better get on the horse because it's time to ride. It's not time to talk about it. What's getting in the way? I mean, obviously, each national government can't take care of the system unto itself. And if one starts to do things and puts its society through transformation, but the others don't join, they can become despondent because things will continue to deteriorate unless we all cooperate. But either of you just, what do you see that's going to kickstart us, we might call, out of fantasy and fear world and into action with well, regard to climate. Reason. That's another reason why we wrote this book. Uh, there's some incredible uh, points of light that you can point to all over the world of, uh, of mm-hmm. incredible action on climate change. But like you said, a stable climate is a global public good. Yes. And, you know, Charles Kindleberger wrote the classic book on the on the public goods that need to be provided in, by global institutions. Uh, but obviously, when Kindleberger was talking, uh, he, there was no thought about climate change. We, the problem wasn't e- wasn't even there. And mm-hmm. so, uh, just like famines, you know, Marty Sen uh, wrote great work uh, many years ago about how there's famines all around the world, but there's no lack of food. Uh, there is a need for an incredible stepwise mobilization of finance uh, to be able to transform the world economy, south and north. Uh, towards a low carbon and more socially inclusive economy. Uh, but it's not that like the finance isn't there. The, the, the number one tenet of our, uh, of our book is that global finance needs to be oriented towards our social and environmental goals. And uh, in the 1940s, when we created these institutions, uh, the, the core thing everyone was concerned about in those days was, hey, full employment and policy autonomy to be able to manage that. The 21st century, that is still full and core decent jobs have to be at the center. Uh, But so does a stable climate, and that can only be done at a a global level. One of the statistics that uh, we think really screams out of this book is that if you look at in 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 the year 1980, uh, the world economy has increased by a factor of about seven and the trade has increased by a factor of about 10. Uh, but finance, uh, which is now in, in trillions of dollars of global assets and liability, is 25 to 35 times larger than it was in 1980. But gross fixed capital formation, what nerds like us call, uh, it's just basic investment, has not changed. And mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, in developing countries, it's gone down. If you take, uh, if you take China out of the equation, that is the one country that has really been uh, investing in, in a future and most recently over the past decade, really putting together the kind of industrial policies to uh, focus on wind and solar. But like you said, the world has to do this, and this is why we call for a global solution and uh, global institutions to make this robust. With all due respect, I, I, lo- I wrote this book with a great friend from the United Nations, and I think the United Nations treaties, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement and so forth, are super important. Uh, treaties in and of themselves, but they have been satellited by these core international economic institutions. And one of the things, especially on climate change, that we're saying in this book is that we cannot pretend that this Paris Agreement is going off, uh, going on on some other part of the planet, and that it has to be mainstreamed and wired in to our global economic institutions, whether it be the G20, the IMF, the World Bank, and the world's network of central banks to provide so much liquidity uh, and so much financial direction around the world. You know, uh, when we when we talk about whether it's climate or the pandemic, I can envision that future textbooks cannot make externalities and public goods chapters 37 and 38. It's on center stage right now. And I believe that from reading your book, the map that you're creating is acknowledging the power and the importance of this collaborative public goods. And I I enjoyed, Kevin, when you were talking about the difference between finance, which is in some levels extracting from the system, from real capital, which is building the system. And when you're extracting more vigorously while not 
enlarging the pie, then the questions of social sustainability also come roaring onto the stage. And uh, that balance, particularly between North and South, seems to me to be uh, essential at this time. And I believe in the Global South, some of the difficulties that others like Richard, when you and I did a thing with Patrick Bond in a panel, talking about how to, what you might call, get capital into the emerging world when the people are afraid of corruption, meaning private capital flows are afraid to go there. They charge an enormous risk premium. But we need the capital to go to the equatorial regions so that solar panels can provide a, a renewable source of non-carbon energy. There's so many dimensions here. But let, let, let's zoom around again a little bit. Richard, where, where do you see this in relation to the pandemic? What, we're, surely, we're surely learning that when we don't vaccinate everyone and a handful of people, like they say, the 10 richest people doubled their net worth through the crisis. And had we taxed them and given everyone a vaccination, we probably would have saved trillions of dollars in macroeconomic assistance that was induced by the crisis and the duration of that crisis. How do, how, what is the pandemic teaching us about the structural reforms that need to be made? Yeah, I, I mean, there are a couple of things and that I would add and to what Kevin said too, Rob, sure. that kind of, you know, clearly come out of the, of the last few years. One is, you know, there has been, and I think this is very much linked to the the whole finan financialization trend. There has been this kind of short-termist mindset has become kind of hardwired into decision making, not just in in, in economic decision making, but political decision making too. And 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 that that when what we're talking about are you know long term challenges that, re that essentially require planning and industrial policy, things that have not have not been consistent or conducive to the kind of narrative that has emerged over the course of the last two or three decades. So that kind of short termist kind of mm -hmm. mindset is 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 a huge challenge. And, and of course, that's linked to and I think this is gets back to the question that you raised about why we're not really seeing the changes. You know, it's interests form around these, you know, the kind of behaviors that you've talked about, these short term is predatory type uh, behaviors that that are not uh, conducive to the kind of investment strategies that we, we we need to see to deliver on these global public goods. And and that was true. That's been true of the of the pan, of the pandemic. Right. I mean, it, it was the 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 speed at which the scientific community collectively came up with a solution through the vaccine has has contrasted sharply with the with what you just mentioned this huge asymmetry in the distribution of the vac vaccine between the north and the south and not only that the resistance of the advanced economies particularly to waive intellectual property to allow developing countries to begin the process of actually being able to make the vaccines themselves right and and qu and quite clearly the power of, of pharmaceutical interest groups you know is 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 uh, central to that, in which intellectual property has its so itself become a source of of rents and rent seeking behaviour. You know, I mean, as you know, all the all the evidence suggests that the kind of intellectual property regime that we have in place now has far less to do with with stimulating innovative behaviour than it than it does with with kind of creating uh, quick rents that that, 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 that that boost profits through extracting value from from elsewhere in the system. Uh, and so, and, and and you know, for us in 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 Geneva and the WTO, that resistance to waiving the TRIPS legislation. I think has been a kind of has been symbolic of of a kind of you know what I would call a kind of neo mercantilist type of behaviour that has become endemic in behind a, a veil of multilateralism. It's it's these very powerful interest groups that have become very influential in shaping the international agenda, which which seems to be inimical with the kinds of challenges that that we're talking about here, which which require this kind of longer term. 
uh, collective planning oriented kind of uh, 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 initiatives if we're going to if we're going to meet them so i you know that that is a particularly worrying i mean you, we can take positives i think from the from the way in which the scientific community did respond in this remarkable way to to the to the pandemic but as we get into the political economy of it that has if if if, if anything it may well have become worse as a consequence of the panic uh, of the pandemic and certainly as we come out of the pandemic and what we're seeing now and what we're experiencing with the with the with the uh, policy shifts that that are taking place in the advanced economies the tightening of monetary policy etc is taking place without any thought for what the consequences of that might be for developing countries that were struggling before the pandemic and now face a, an increasingly hostile international environment that 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 is going to has already begun to tip some of these countries uh, into social and political conflict uh, conflict we've seen that in countries like sri lanka and and unless something is done seriously about these issues and quickly will will become a a, a much more prevalent feature of the geopolitical landscape and that's got to be a worry for everybody yeah I'll, I'll use an analogy from my own life experience i grew up in detroit michigan when detroit declared bankruptcy people said what do you mean bankruptcy you can tax people and i was working there in, as an advisor to people who were trying to resolve what was happening and i said you can raise taxes on the body politic so you don't have to reduce the pension and the health care for women who worked for 45 years in municipal government and earned those rights. And by the way, they're not eligible for Social Security or Medicare because they were covered by this other system. And everybody said, well, what do you do? I said, well, a company declares bankruptcy when it doesn't have revenue. All you guys have to do is raise the taxes. And a gentleman happened to be in the Republican Party from the state legislature, said, I need to talk to you. And he said, you're right, we could raise taxes. And as soon as we did, someone would run in a primary against me, well-funded by people, because they threaten to move their capital out anytime you do anything. And we think that would devastate the base. But more important than that, I'll lose my job if I back supporting these people. So you have these ladies, 45 years of work, not being rewarded because capital has nanosecond escape possibilities and politicians are afraid of them. I'm speaking about a particular institutional episode, but that's kind of what you might call the generic tension in the era of globalization, where nation-state control has deteriorated and capital and technology being so mobile have so much relative power compared to people. Kevin, you have thoughts regarding the, how would I say, there's that saying, it's all, we're all in this together, but as I was listening to Richard, Sometimes we're not, because they create an otherness and rally around what we might call the nation state or the community or a subset of the community to protect them. But not dealing with some of these things like disease can come flowing right back on top of us. And being tribal is which you might call contributing to the cumulative damage that not only others will feel, but will feel. Well, we, we throughout the book, we, we really see three inherent things that are sort of fundamentally characteristic of the world economy right now. And, and like you said, uh, they can't be in chapters 37 and 38 of economics textbooks of the 21st <laughs> century, right? Because what you just said about pandemics, if you don't deal with it anywhere, it's going to hurt people everywhere. It's right. the same thing about climate change. If we don't yes. deal with climate change globally, more droughts and more fires in California, it's more taxing on, uh, on the public budget here in the United States, and it wipes out the entire capital stock in countries like uh, in Barbados, et cetera, and causes fundamental financial instability there. So climate and pandemics, you know, we, we really see this book as, uh, as acknowledging the fact that the world economy is now inherently financially unstable, economically unequal, 
and environmentally unstable. And all of these things are global public goods. When there's financial instability anywhere, we see it over and over again with the financial crises that keep racking us, it is everywhere. If uh, inequality is, is creating increased polarization, rising of right-wing populism, and obviously climate and pandemics are also just globally costing so much. So what, you know, in terms of this book is really about starting a global conversation about putting these things at the center. And what I think is different about the 21st century now, because as Richard has said, and we say throughout the book, and obviously you know, a lot of these problems have started in the late 1970s and early 1980s. But what is so, uh, so characteristic of the 21st century now is that they're, they're all right on our front radar screen and the constituents, unfortunately, of the people who have been hurt are all over the planet. It's not just poor farmers in Mexico that we're going to get hurt by the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, now it's the folks in Detroit. It's the folks in Poland who will have to shift from coal to clean air. Uh, same thing with, with South Africa and the, uh, the folks in, in the Caribbean. And so there, uh, there is a conversation that needs to happen that we hope to kick off with this book. And that if you think about these three core parts of instability, financial instability, inequality, and instable climate, climate and health systems, if you put those at the center and you say, hey, dealing with these things are not charity. They're not little issues that need to be dealt with that they need, we need to rewire the system to make sure that these fundamental things that are public goods are at the heart of the system and that these are investments rather than charity giveaways, you start mm -hmm. to have a different conversation with all different kinds of folks, including the Republican that you talked to uh, in, in Detroit. Investing in people, investing in infrastructure, investing in a new economy uh, helps people get jobs and helps people get reelected. And yeah. the big problem has been a lack of investment. The investment that we've had has been towards a 21st century, a 20th century economy, uh, and it's been anemic while we've extracted all of this financialization that has been going in a different direction, which has been feeding off of itself. We need to make sure that the financial system and the trade system is oriented towards our development, equality, and climate change goals and if we sit and have a set of principles that guide us and say, hey, what are these fundamental things for the 21st century? We can rewire these institutions uh, towards those goals. And that's what we're really talking about in this book. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I would just add, Rob, I mean, you know, we, you know, I know people are worried sometimes about historical parallels, but I mean, using the New Deal as a, it's not an accident. I mean, you know, I mean, Ironically, those three things that Kevin mentioned were, of course, central to the Roosevelt agenda. Right? There was an environmental crisis uh, linked to, to, to the Dust Bowl and other problems. There was a, obviously financial instability in, uh, that, that, that came out of the Great Depression. Uh, and, and, of course, in, uh, there was um, rampant inequality that had to be uh, dealt with uh, by the original New Deal. So, so you, know, that, you know, in a sense, you know, we, and, and, and what we what I appreciate what I think has often been lost in that in, in that telling of the historical story th there was a strong internationalist dimension to the new deals they're often tarred as somehow kind of inward looking a protectionist agenda and I find that to be very misleading in terms of of the of, of, of the historical narrative and it's it's not an accident these the same people that that, that, that were concerned with these issues domestically often were the same people who were uh, behind the, the, the uh, original discussions to build a multilateral architecture that, that would also tackle these problems worldwide. And, it, you know, when you, list, when you read, I mean, you know, Morgenthau, who a, is a, has an interesting history and you wouldn't necessarily think as, as being a kind of hero in that kind of world, is a kind of hero in our, in our books. And, and his... his I think that the, the contribution of people like him to the original uh, Bretton Woods story is often forgotten, partly because, you know, there was a strong pushback in the United States uh, 
uh, fairly early, uh, from 40, when after Roosevelt died, against a lot of the ri- original intentions of the of the designers of Bretton Woods. I mean, the pushback against that kind of need to control highly mobile speculative capital begins very early in the U.S. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's it's a, you know, it took them a while really to uh, rewire the system in a way that they wanted and it doesn't really happen until the late 70s early 1980s but you know they began that pushback early early on and and you know and so it was a very conscious effort to to go back to the new deal and its original intent uh, to think about what they achieved and were trying to achieve uh, back then and what is still useful uh, today, I mean, there are there have been significant changes, of course, in the structure of the global economy since then that have to be accommodated by any sort of new multilateral agenda. But there are real lessons from that period that need to be uh, recovered, I think, if we're going to have that kind of more inclusive uh, um, and, and sustainable uh, agenda that, that Kevin that Kevin talked about. I'm uh, drawn as I was reading your book to someone that, uh, with John Bellamy Foster and uh, Robert McChesney turned me on to many years ago. And it was a man called the Earl of Lauderdale. He was the 13th Earl of Lauderdale. And he read The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And he, I, I guess what I would say, he raised a specter in 1804 saying, what do you mean air and water have no value because they have zero price? If you cut them off, we all die. And I guess what Adam Smith was saying was that exchange value, when the population was small in relation to the planet, meant that you didn't have to pay for air and water and you could survive. It seems as though that balance has changed. And what I guess I'm getting at is this is a little bit like I made a podcast recently with a man named Peter Barnes from Northern California. It, the idea is that the earth, the water, the ocean, the fish, the upper atmosphere are assets, but they haven't been properly treated as assets that need to be preserved, cultivated, enhanced, whatever you want to call it, we don't have the mindset that indigenous people had that were so dependent upon the earth. And perhaps since the industrial revolution, we've parted ways further with dependence upon the earth. But these assets now, it's almost like, if you want to say, the spirits are coming down on us pretty hard to change course. And, and it concerns me now because I feel like and we haven't talked about this yet, but the the nationalism and the fear that the Ukraine conflict is bringing to the surface is taking us further toward what I will call the, the Bismarck playbook. When you can't handle all the fear and instability at home, pandemic, social unsustainability, you declare a foreign enemy to rally everybody behind you to get them to obey. In this context, with these other assets, these public goods deteriorating, that diversion of focus is going to exacerbate rather than ameliorate the kind of things we need to do together. How do we in China get together when Xi Jinping and Putin and the American administration are all playing which you might call demonization games with one another? Yeah, look, I think that is, I mean, that is the major, obviously a major concern that we have um, where, where, where we are in, in Geneva, Rob, um, because, you know, I mean, you know, power politics in that, the big, what the big players do is going to be critical. That's clear. That was clear at COP uh, at the end of, at the end of, of last year. Um, you know, I mean, I guess for us, I, I mean, Kevin has pointed out that, you know, China has done some pretty remarkable things over the course of the last two decades, including with respect to the environment, although it's still, it is now, of course, the world's largest 
single largest emitter. That's partly a reflection of its size, partly a, re a reflection of the fact that it had to grow so quickly to be able to deliver the, the, the huge reductions in poverty that people were celebrating until a, a few a few years ago, uh, you know, I, I guess our, my po uh, you know what worries me more, uh, Rob, is the attitude of the of the what is still the hegemon, right? The U.S., despite all the talk of deglobalization and de-dollarization and and the fragment, uh, the United States remains the hegemon mm -hmm. in this world, economically and militarily. That's fairly clear. Um, and you and and you know we we went through a, a brief period with the new administration where there was a lot of talk about the parallels between the Biden administration and and the Roosevelt uh, administration and the hope that that kind of same, similar mindset would be and and including at the international level clearly Biden had a much more of a multilateral spirit than than the previous administration had that that's clear. Um, but it doesn't seem to have lasted, and and I, I think behind it, you know, and 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 it's the one, it's this very intangible quality that that is critical but difficult to kind of pin down at both the national and the international level, which is the role of trust in any system. Uh, the, a, a system, all, all systems have their different interests, and, and if but if you have a a system which is which has different interests and no trust, it's very difficult to get any degree of consensus and, and kind of forward thinking in that system. And, and you know, trust is being now hemorrhaged from the multilateral system and, and the war is, is, not, is not the cause of that. I think it's, it's, it may well accelerate that in the way that you described. Um, but, you know, behind that is the hemorrhaging of trust from from particularly the most powerful countries in the world. I mean, trust is now a scarce factor in the advanced capitalist economies, I think, you know, and, and, and I think that I think thinking about that problem of rebuilding trust uh, uh, in, in the leading uh, market economies has to be central to any uh, hope of being able to meet these challenges uh, through collective action at the multilateral level. And that, that is a difficult problem to think through, but it is a central issue in in this in in any sort of progressive discourse that needs to be needs to be constructed yeah. Kevin, you and i live i was going to say you and i live in the united states when he talks about the deterioration of trust we have people like angus deaton and ann case writing about the diseases of despair we have a guy like donald trump getting elected for president by running around saying the system is rigged i think he's right on target about one of the assets that is deteriorating in the United States. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely true, and it's it's uh, it's disheartening to see that in a democracy where we should be deliberating, but uh, we're turning from deliberating to to demonization. Um, mm -hmm. You know, on a professional level, uh, you know, security and 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 war is, is a bit above my pay grade, but I want to make sure we put uh, put Putin in a different category than than China, and I think. Uh, one silver lining is that China has provided some healthy competition uh, to Western hegemony on these issues. Uh, the, the West, as, as hegemons, has not really acted, right? We failed in pulling together the world to adequately deal with the financial crisis and again with COVID. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, uh, China put together the Belt Road Initiative and started building roads and infrastructure all over around the world where all of a sudden the World Bank and international institutions and, and the West started saying, oh, gosh, we have to start paying attention to infrastructure. And so now there's infrastructure financing going on at the World Bank, and there's a whole global effort to try to do that. And uh, sometimes this, this competition is getting increasingly unhealthy because the West is seeing it as a zero sum game. Uh, but not to deny that China has geopolitical uh, motivations for all of their policy, as do we. That's what created the entire, uh, the entire regime in, in 1944. And the larger they get, the more interest they have to protect around the world. But their global policy on their Belt Road Initiative is to help create interconnectivity and lay the, the foundations in terms of infrastructure for the 21st century. And just in March of 2021, they committed for that to be a low carbon Belt Road initiative. They're no longer going to finance coal uh, projects around the world, and they're shifting into wind and solar. And so I see that as uh, let's the United States doesn't have a foreign policy like that. Europe doesn't have a foreign policy like that. Japan doesn't have a foreign policy like that. That's healthy competition 
that will help green these institutions. And uh, if I think the, the hegemonic states at this point uh, really face a choice uh, to bring us back to the trust conversation, we need to learn how to make these institutions more inclusive in terms of governments, other countries, and the citizens in those countries. Uh, and we need to make them broader to deal with also issues of inequality and climate change. And if, we're, if we don't, there are increasing alternatives where countries can go. If you don't like uh, the kind of projects that you might get from the World Bank, uh, you can have uh, China finance a wind farm in your country. You know, Argentina doesn't want to go to the International Monetary Fund because they keep making them uh, privatize more and more uh, and get rid of more and more government. So they went to China and got the largest solar power plant uh, in Latin America. Um, so I see the rise of the rest, as uh, Alice Amzen used to call it, uh, a good, healthy, competitive uh, signal to the world about how we need to be more accommodative and more inclusive uh, and bring these issues right into the center. Yeah, I think I think you're really touching Yeah, and I on... think I think that speaks, Rob, to a... Uh, you... Sorry, I just say I think you're really talking about something that's very important in the dynamic. I just had a nice conversation with Kishore Mabubani about 21st century Asia. A young lady named Joanna Chu, who writes for the Toronto Star, is from China originally, and they're they're both capable of being very critical of China. But it's not all demon. It's not all good, all bad. Adair Turner, who works closely with me here at INET, talks about how we've had a pleasant surprise because the cost of renewables, wind and solar, have come down so much because of the public investment in R&D that's been done in China. So there's there's plus and minus columns in all of this, and uh, to demonize China is to miss some of the positive elements that I, that you underscore. And there's an important lesson there, of course, for the what we try and say in the book, you know, which is the need, again, part of the original model was is this need to get back to public finance and public investment, international and domestic, which was the original intent of the mm -hmm. of, of the of the Bretton Woods model. And, and, and you know, China is a is essentially a public finance, public investment model. Um, you know, one of our frustrations, even though we are critical in the book about some of the recent um, policy conditionalities and other uh, practices of the multilateral institutions, they're massively underfunded, uh, you know, given the, given the kind of scales that they, uh, the scale of the problems that they face and, and the mechanisms that they could mobilize to, to, to address those problems. I mean, we want to see more financing come through the multilateral financing institutions, whether that's at the international level or indeed at the regional level. And, and you know, there's, you, with respect to the climate issue, for example, there is a kind of knee-jerk reaction that somehow only private finance can solve this problem. And whilst in any market economy, private finance has to have a critical role. The idea, this idea that public, public investment is, is somehow, you know, 20th century or mid 20th century as, a, as, a, as part of a policy paradigm is, is, is both deeply misleading, but ultimately, I, you know, will we'll, we'll make it increasingly difficult to deliver on the kind of projects investment projects for mitigation and ad adaptation that, you know, as the IPCC report essentially needs to be in place over the course of the next five years. I don't, the private, the, you know, private financing, particularly the way it's currently constructed, is not going to deliver the kind of projects we're talking about over the next five years. And, and so unless we get the, private, the public financing model right, get back to the, 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 the role that development banks can play, public banks can play, using sovereign wealth funds and other mechanisms, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to take a fairly bleak view, if you take the science seriously, of, 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 uh, um, of our abilities to meet these, these exacting targets that people now know we have to meet. Yes. Uh, there's a, uh, a writer with the New York Times who I recently talked to, Peter Goodman, who's written his book, which is getting a lot of attention, called Davos Man. But earlier than that, Peter and I talked about an article he wrote, which was called, I believe it was in the New York Times, late 2019, called 
we love or early 2019 excuse me we love the robots and it was about the process of a society embracing transformation in other words what economists call the production possibility frontier improves with an innovation but how you transit who gets damaged who are the losers who are the winners we used to get that parable when we were taking economics courses free trade can make everyone better off and nobody worse off but the asterisk on that comment is you've got to do the transformational assistance i have friends from west virginia now who are telling me well you grew up in detroit you expect us to play along with this global public good and get trampled we need to work with china but a whole lot of americans who got trampled by globalization with no assistance either from tech you know, you know uh, machine learning and automation or from globalization don't want any part of that but that's not a failing of the possibilities that's a failing of our political economy and the transformation that could have made everybody better off and we have to start to see that like we talked about the pervasiveness of the side effects and how we choose a pathway that considers everyone it, it's it's almost as if people have to be given more power and money less power or what you might call votes uh, but it but it's very very daunting to see how despondent and discouraged americans are about the possibilities of global cooperation at exactly the time as your book underscores in many contexts is necessary how do we well, how do we start I, that rebuilding of that trust that you've been talking about? Well, our our, our book is uh, is is one very small uh, uh, effort to try to start a conversation to to put some of this together. And, and what you're referring to is is what a lot of us call a just transition. And what we say in this mm -hmm. book that we really need a just transition within borders and across borders. Mm -hmm. And the great experiment with free trade and globalization from 1980 to 2020 uh, created an incredible amount of structural transformation and an incredible amount of wealth creation. But those that were left behind were just completely left behind. Like you said, the production possibilities expanded. Uh, they were Pareto efficient. Um, but folks in Detroit, rural farmers in Mexico, you, uh, industrialized workers in, in Brazil and in South Africa, uh, these folks were not the winners, and there was no public insistence, no steering of financial of private sector finance to help those entrepreneurs, those communities, and those workers get the opportunities in the new in the new sectors. And we can't make that mistake that we made on globalization, the mistake that we make on structural transformation for reworking the global economy into a low carbon and more socially inclusive one. It is clear that the Polands and the Kentuckys and the South Africas and the Trinidad and Tobago's do not have those natural assets that they were able to export and create livelihoods for in the 20th century. Those are going to be stranded assets into the 21st century. We can strand the assets, but not the people and not the entrepreneurs and not the communities. And that's an underscore a role for global public institutions for the north-south component. If the Europeans are going to have a carbon border adjustment tax, well, part of that tax should go to finance transitions in places like Mozambique that export so much, uh, so much carbon intensive activity to, uh, to the Europeans. And just like in the United States, our economy will be much better off as we go low, low carbon if you incorporate the uh, externalities. But certainly certain sectors, communities and workers are going to shrink. And we need to make sure that those folks are put at the front of the line, that we're investing in those people in those places so they can be part of the transformation. Because what we've learned from globalization, you talk about the rise of right wing populism and Donald Trump and all this global conflict is that we see a lot of this rise of conflict as a symptom of not doing the globalization transformation right over the past 40 mm -hmm. years. We have mm -hmm. to do it. And as the IPCC report tells us, we have to do it now. And, and we have done it before, Rob. I mean, the, you know, one of the funny things about the right, the China story is that, 
you know, back in the 60s and 70s, the rise of countries like Japan and the first, the, the East Asian NICs was, and their, their rising share of global trade was, was tremendously rapid. Uh, it's just that at that time, the response was not to kind of uh, uh, become more introverted. It was, to, it was to invest in alternative job opportunities for people in coal mines in the north of England or textile workers in, the, in, in New England because, you know, you could, you could generate better jobs for people than those, than, than, than those kinds of jobs. But, of course, it requires this, it requires a, it's, I mean, it requires a capitalist class, essentially, that is willing to take, take its profits and reinvest those profits in job-creating areas. And, and that's what happened to some extent in the 60s and into the 1970s. Uh, you know, you, in a world where huge chunks of profits are being used to buy back uh, shares or to to pay out large dividend payments, then that social role of investment is is being eroded, and 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 the and the and the symptoms that that you, we've seen, the the kind of pathologies of of twenty first century politics, follow from that inability of the system to use the resource it has available to create new opportunities for people that are, are moving out of declining industries. And, and in, our, in our story, those new opportunities have to be in a low carbon, uh, carbon or carbon free economy. And, and the opportunities are there. We have some systemic problems, though, that make that virtuous circle, I think, difficult to difficult to establish. But again, I would go, you know, we would I would go back at least to to kind of getting back to a story in which you know the opportunities for public investment uh, are, 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 are given much greater room. Gets but gets us back to some awkward questions about about do we need to nationalise the fossil fuel industries to be able to make the kind of changes that that Kevin talked about? I mean, this takes you into more politically uncomfortable territory. But but you know, the, it's not that we haven't been here before. We have been here before, and and. And, you know, we did some things right then, we did some things wrong then. I think learning those lessons as we move forward to meet these 21st century challenges, is, you know, is, is at least in a small way the intent of the book. And I think it's a conversation that is urgently needed if we are going to address these problems. Yeah. I uh, am haunted at times, going back to your reference to the New Deal. There seemed to be a time when if you looked at public opinion polls, people on the far right would just say worshipped markets and people on the left worshipped government. And what really haunted me is during the Obama years, and by the way, I would always recommend uh, David Sirota and Alex Gibney's new podcast called Meltdown about the deterioration of the country in the aftermath of not doing what that opportunity, that crisis created. But what I saw in 2010 and 2011 was polls like the Gallup poll about belief in government. And what happened was the people on the right still believed in the market, but the people on the left thought government was captured. And the reason I raise that specter now, I, do, I have read a book uh, a year or so ago by Naomi Klein's older brother, Seth Klein, called The Good War, about the essentially the analogy to Canadian war preparation at the time of World War II. They entered the Allied side three years before the United States. And Seth talks about essentially the need to do that, but a whole lot of very interesting people like Jeff Mann and Joel, Joel Wainwright and everybody said, whoa, 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 we're in a place where people are so afraid government is captured if we give them that power, will they actually do good or will they continue in what you might call the rent extraction process? And so inspiring the body politic of the need for the state and the pervasiveness of externalities, public goods, like we've been talking about, seems to me to be a formidable challenge because of the woundedness in recent years and the distrust of governance that has ensued. How do we, how do we overcome I don't know. You know, you can sing "We Shall Overcome," but we got we got to have a hypothesis here. How do we get there? And I think you know. Look, guys, I went to a conference recently, 
that was a exploration of Dr. King's speech, Time to Break the Silence, Beyond Vietnam. And you guys are like Dr. King. You're calling out the truth. You know, he took quite a beating. New York Times, Washington Post, many of the affiliates that he had in the Civil Rights Movement got mad at him because he went after that when he talked about militarism, materialism, and racism as the triad of poisons to our society. But I've watched you write a book kind of like his speech. You rose to the occasion. You brought, you brought this out. But how do we now evolve what you might call the North Star you created? How do we create the spaceship to get us to that North Star? Well, it's interesting that you say that uh, that you just read that because if you if you look at page one in our book, uh, we actually quote uh, Dr. King, and I should yes. say on this podcast a a great uh, a great graduate of Boston University here. If I could, I'd <laughs> love right. to share that. Uh, if I could, I'd love to share that quote because we 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 feel like that those words uh, around the Vietnam War really ring true for the call that we're making today. He says. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of the now. Yes. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. So we are re-echoing that same call that he made and saying, gosh, those words are even more resonant uh, or just as resonant now, uh, and especially if you bring climate change into the story and listen to what the IPCC just said. But how to do it? We are researchers, economists, and think tanks. We're writing a book to try to have a global uh, conversation. But in our last chapter, we, uh, we evoke uh, the words of another great person in history, John Kenneth Galbraith and his concept of countervailing power. One of the reasons why the Roosevelt administration and ensuing years moving forward was that there was coalitions of countervailing power, different kinds of actors that were able to negotiate with capital to be able to discipline capital and discipline the state. We think that the capital needs to be disciplined, the state needs to be disciplined, and these international institutions. We're not saying pump more money into the government, into the International Monetary Fund, it's going to change these problems. Is that there, where there needs to be countervailing power. And we see it in, in a lot of different places. I already mentioned that China is a healthy form of global competition on some of these issues. Uh, the different movements, uh, we see uh, Amazon organizing for unions in the United States. We see the Green New Deal movement in the United States. Uh, we see the fact that the European Union has legislated net zero and has uh, legislation that they're deliberating about, uh, about just transitions. Uh, those are the kinds of... Uh, countervailing power that you can see in the North, and what's inspiring now in the South, especially in the midst of uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, is the reemergence of a non-aligned movement, a reemergence of a number of countries around the world that, of course, are going to condemn uh, the uh, obstruction of, uh, of, the, of the sovereignty of an individual nation, but they're not going to, uh, they're, they're not going along with, with sanctions and they want something to be done with the global economic ramifications. The fact that oil prices and wheat and grain prices are skyrocketing when before the invasion of Ukraine in January, the World Bank sounded the alarm and said that just the interest rate rises in the United States might put 60 countries that are in debt distress over the cliff into a debt crisis. And we already saw Sri Lanka uh, making that step over that. Now with the, with the spikes in, in grain and oil, uh, that debt issue is even uh, an, an even bigger one. And if we have a debt crisis uh, like we had in the past, that again hurts everybody here, uh, wherever you are uh, in, the, in the world. Richard, you want to add? Yeah, look, I mean, that's, you know, for us, building coalitions amongst developing countries is, is critical to rebalancing the international order. It's, and, and we have to be honest, it's what we lack at the moment, say, compared with the 1970s when we got the initiative to try and uh, create a new international economic order that developing countries uh, pursued through the, through the United Nations. But, but you know, as, as Kevin said, there are, there are clearly signs of, 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 of change. I think a number of the ideas, I mean, and to take just to follow up on Kevin's point, 
you know, I think there is a growing recognition um, that we cannot so we cannot make the kinds of investments that we make to that we need to to make to deal with the climate and and other problems, given the burden of debt that many developing countries now uh, uh, operate under. It's uh, it doesn't just doesn't work doesn't add up, and and I think there is slowly a move to to fill this gap of a, of of within the multilateral order of a of mechanisms that can properly handle the uh, the, the 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 debt problem and martin guzman as you, you i think you know the, the finance minister of of argentina rob has always said we have a system that deliver always delivers too little too late and countries mm -hmm. even if they go through some sort of restructuring often find themselves back in the same position four or five years later not necessarily through any corruption or incompetence on their part but simply because outside pressures just kind of force them back into a corner and and so and 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 so I, you know and, and I think there is a real serious uh, conversation now building to 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 think more creatively about the about the need to handle an issue like that, which is it's going to be the big issue for the next three or four years in the developing world in a much more effective way than we than than we have. You know, there, there's the famous aphorism of Bertolt Brecht: "Because things are the way they are, things will not stay the way they are." And I think that at this moment in time, I think that's a particularly appropriate kind of degree of optimism for thinking about the, the, the challenges ahead that we face. Well, Kevin, uh, I, I am smiling when you reminded me of Dr. King being at uh, Boston University, in part because the person that I am most immersed in reading for my own education, my own evolution right now, was his mentor, a man named Howard Thurman. Books like The Luminous Darkness, are, are extraordinary. And this is a man, when he was trying to figure out in early in the 20th century how to be effective, he got himself sent to India to meet Gandhi and explore how to be what you might call fierce and inspire trust or alleviate fear at the same time. And he is a very, very profound influence on Dr. King. When I was at this conference a few days ago, uh, Dr. King's youngest child, Bernice King, was one of the speakers at the end. And she and the other panelists, Andrew Basevich from the Quincy Foundation, the former military official, and others were, were really quite powerful. And I started thinking about the question of how fear is really the obstacle in the way of what we need to do. Your book, As a North Star, gives us a destination. We know where the voyage has to go through the clarity and the insight and the profoundness of your argument. But to alleviate fear, as we've talked about, we also have to bring the trust together. We have to have action. We have to see people doing things that deliver results but I think the alleviation of fear was very profoundly in the mind of Dr. King in his writings. And at this conference, they closed with a song. And the name of the song by a man named Brian Courtney Wilson is Fear is Not Welcome. In the beginning of the song, I'll read you the lyrics. Let me begin and confess, I need your healing. I, may f I made a friend of the fear that I have been feeling, and I believe the lies it spoke that led me into doubt, but I'm calling on your angels' army now. And then the chorus, fear is not welcome, fear is not welcome, fear is not welcome in my heart anymore. I'm, I'm casting it away by the power of your name. Fear is not welcome in my heart anymore. 